There is a new movie in town, and the producers and director of the movie are really proud of the effects that are in this movie. Now, most often you hear about producers and directors talking about uh, the special effects that uh, can make it possible for uh, an aircraft carrier to have wings and fly over Washington, D.C., and to do it in such a way that it seems credible. Now, these producers were really happy that not only could they do that in their movie, this would be Captain America, the Winter Soldier. No, I'm not getting paid for this. And <clears throat> the other thing was the car crashes. They actually used like 13 cars. And, and they wanted to make that as realistic as possible. And all too often, what they're attempting to do, or what we fall into the trap of doing when we talk about something like that, we go, oh, wasn't that a believable effect? Well, frankly, it registers up in this part of your brain. It's a thinking thing. You think, therefore, it could happen. Believe, for me, believe is what happens when you hear the scripture often at the great vigil of Easter, but you heard it this morning. It's the valley of the dry bones. It's, it's where God breathes on the bones. And the bones take life and get up and start walking. Now, if, if Hollywood would do that, that would be Ray Harryhausen, the great special effects artist, because he actually did that with bones. But they get up and they come up. To me, I believe that God's breath can breathe life into that. I believe in the words that it means to say to set your heart on something. I set my heart. It makes perfect sense that God could breathe life into those bones and have them walk. Where does this come from? Well, in our scripture today with Jesus and being called to Bethany to the side of Lazarus who was dying and now dying, Martha meets Jesus up on the road. And they have this incredible discussion where she accosts him. He asks her, do you believe? And she, she gives a fairly cursory understanding of belief. It's almost as if it's like a catechism throwback to Jesus. And then all of a sudden, he presses her some more and much like in the way we sing in the words of the song, I am the bread of life. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is to come into the world. It's as if in that moment, someone who has been so close to Jesus has been able to find the right perspective and see him anew. Even though she's disappointed that he wasn't there, she sees something larger and can make. Frankly, an incredible statement of faith that bears itself out as the story unfolds and Jesus eventually cries out to Lazarus, come out, and he does. <coughs> what a gift to Mary. What a gift to Martha to see that happen to Lazarus. What gift have you received? Not unlike the gift that Peter, James, and John, Peter in particular, I think, received on the transfiguration when they could see Jesus in the fullness of his glory as he truly is. What gift do you have that you could take, if you will, into Holy Week, into the moments when we cry out, crucify him, into the moments when we watch him die, in the moments when we and the rest of the crowd run away? What is it that you could hold on to to say that it is not ended? That Christ is truly real and present in my life? What gift perhaps have you been given that you could call upon in dark moments to remember the light of Christ? With that as a backdrop, I want to share a story. Now, this is a story about me. It's a story from, frankly, and was hard to think about it this way, half a lifetime ago, 1984. I am a 
newly received Episcopalian by about two and a half months, coming out of a Roman, half, Roman Catholic upbringing. The little church in Yarmouth, Maine, the little gas station church I told you about, I was received there and was beginning to find some of the sense of my faith in it. I, we had a, a new vicar who had come on board, so there was a full-time priest. <clears throat> he had prepared me to be received, <clears throat> given me a book of common prayer. We had gone through it, and I had some cursory knowledge of how the thing worked. I was also the general manager of a radio station. And it was a single owner station, and the boss decided that if we reached some sales goals, we would have a trip during the winter time, meaning like late January, early February, where we would leave the cold confines of southern Maine and go to the Florida Keys. And we would get on a sailing boat. Well, we made our goal, and we got down there, and here we are. We're on a 50 or a 55 foot sailboat. Now, I need to explain to you how much I know about sailing. I've learned, and frankly the hard way, that thing that's in the middle that goes back and forth, if you don't duck, it's a problem. That much I knew. So here we are, <clears throat> we're on the boat with the seven or eight members of the sales team, the boss and everybody. He actually knew how to operate this contraption. And the first night, after a lovely day, we tie up at a dock. And the dock is made of cement. Tie it up really tight. And we get off. And we go to a great restaurant and have a lovely night with perhaps one or two extra libations. Get back on, on the boat, and it's a lovely place to sleep because it hardly moves. So there we are. The next day, we get up, and we get out, and we not only motor out, but something to do with the wind and the sails, and we head out. Lovely day. Oh, man, it was great fun. Then nighttime came, and we stopped the boat in the middle of this big, like a lagoon or, well, the land was far enough away you couldn't swim to it. Uh, and they threw this thing over the side that had cement on it. Somebody said it was called an anchor. And it was supposed to stop the boat and keep it right there. Well, we enjoyed our meal, night came, and I'm in my little sleeping compartment, berth or whatever, and something is happening. My, my sleeping position is beginning to move. Back and forth. It's, it's not soothing. And I decided at about 3.30 in the morning, I was gonna, I knew what was happening. So I got up, I took my backpack with me because I was gonna sit on the back and I was going to keep an eye on things. So I got in the back of the boat. I think that's called the stern. Yeah, the stern. I was in the back of the boat all by myself. And the night was a night that had lots of stars. And I, I could pick one. I picked one star way up there. And then I picked a point on the land I could see. And with my basic remembrance of any form of high school geometry, I drew a triangle and I said, okay, I'm gonna keep an eye on it. We go this close, ooh, this close. Well, it kept going back and forth and while my imagination put us closer to the shoreline, we never really got there. And I'll tell you, it was an anxious night for me. Now, I'm also a new Episcopalian. And, and as a new Episcopalian, I was really happy that I decided, I was, I actually took my prayer book, my brand new prayer book, this prayer book, I took with me on my trip. Because I had committed to trying to do some form of prayer. I, I had heard this thing about morning prayer that, that we didn't do on Sundays, that you might do during the week. And I figured the book would have instructions in it. So here I am, 
it's, there's enough light now that the stars are just beginning to move away a little bit. And I pull my prayer book out and I, I flip through it and I see the morning prayer part. I realized I forgot to bring a Bible, which must have meant I was really doing a good job being an Episcopalian. <laughs> but I had my prayer book. And, and, I, and I flipped into the back and I finally said, oh look, they have it broken down. This looks like the week I'm in. And I said, well, I may not have a, I may not have a Bible, but it suggests I could pray a psalm. Remember, I've been on a boat that's been swaying back and forth. I've been nervous, I've been anxious, and I open up the prayer book, and God leads me. And remember, the Psalms come out of the Bible. They're the, the Hebrew hymnal. So you think about what they were expressing when they prayed these. I get this, and here it is, Psalm 130. Out of the depths have I called you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears consider well the voice of my supplication. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits for him. In his word is my hope. More than watchmen for the morning. I had, as you can tell, been living the psalm. What a wonderful gift from God. But the gift didn't stop. Because as I was experiencing this, that red thing on the horizon, the kind of a glow or an orb, started to poke itself up. And bright light and rays started to shimmer along the ocean far off into the distance. No land out there, but this incredible sight of the sun rise coming up. And I felt drawn to write about this. I had a yellow pad. I started writing on it. I wrote a letter to my vicar about this experience. I wish he'd kept it. <laughs> I'd love to have seen it. <laughs> but it was a profound moment. <clears throat> Brighter than bright. Like the transfiguration. Like the gift given to Peter, James, and John. The sun rising, which we anticipate on Easter Sunday. The pun is intended. All of this was mixed into this memory which was so profound. I had spent a lifetime getting to this moment and a night living it. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. In Him is my hope. I had a night of fear as to what would happen to me in this boat. And the opportunity to begin to trust was offered. <laughs> when I least expected it and needed it most, God was fully present in a way that I can never forget. And so I offer this connection to Scripture, this connection to God, this just connection to say to you that perhaps somewhere in your road to Emmaus experience, like Clopas and his companion in the breaking of the bread, or somewhere in your road to Damascus experience with Paul getting knocked off his horse, or somewhere or somehow, just maybe, you can find a moment like this that keeps you connected when indeed, like Mary, like Martha, when they needed it most, God was fully present. And the way they could acknowledge it was to say, yes, Lord, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. All these words I offer in the name of God.
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <laughs>